to do this. All right, we'll use my phone, I guess. I just got the phone sitting here on my screen. Well, welcome everybody online and in the room. I think I've got that set up right, so we'll try it and see. Uh, we are in John 16 um, and 17, I think is the goal, uh, is what we want to try to get through today. We are currently, it is Friday evening, basically, is the time frame. And uh, remembering that the evening in Jewish days comes before the day. So Friday evening, they've concluded the Lord's Supper, transitioning from Thursday, so 6 p.m., becomes Friday. So it's the Friday night portion of the day for the Jews. And he is on his way to the Garden of Gethsemane. Um, he spoke in chapter 15 about basically how his disciples are to focus on the fact that they are extensions of him and that their source of power, their source of message, their source of everything should come and stem back to what Jesus has taught them and what Jesus is to them. A big important message. So why, why do we think that he went about it that way? What was the impact of that message? Just thinking about the future, how it was going to be going forward. Exactly. He was he was trying to implant in them, hey, I'm going to be gone, but you still have work to do, and you still need to depend on me, which he tells them in this chapter um, that he's still going to be with us through the Holy Spirit of God. So he's he's kind of putting things in a logical sequence here to try to encourage his disciples the type of behavior they should have, the type of mindset and the hope that they uh, can have still being in Jesus Christ. So that's kind of where we are. He concludes, concludes chapter 15 with a not-so-friendly and, and pleasant thought, but he, he tells them the world's going to hate you, <laughs> but don't you know be too bent out of shape about it because the reason they hate you is because they hate me, and the reason they hate me is because they hate God. Uh, the Father. So he's kind of setting this up, preparing them somewhat for the future. And he says in verse 26 of chapter 15, When the Comforter has come, whom I will send to you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth which proceedeth from the Father, he will testify of me. Chapter 16, he continues the conversation. Again, they are continuing to, I'm assuming at this point they're walking towards the Garden of Gethsemane um, because we find out in chapter 17 and 18 that's where they're at, mainly chapter 18. Um, they're in the garden, so they're probably walking towards the garden at this point. Maybe they're about to enter it, but he's simply continuing the conversation. He says, These things have I spoken unto you that you should not be offended. How often do Christians get offended? At just about anything and everything in this day and time. Um, and he's encouraging them, don't be offended when these things happen. He says, they will put you out of the synagogues. Yes, the time comes that whosoever killeth you will think that he's doing God a service. That's a pretty bold thought there. But it's true. You know, what did... Uh, Paul do. Saul, yeah. yeah. Before he was Paul, he was Saul, and that was his mission, was killing Christians. Mm -hmm. And he explains later, he thought he was doing the right thing. Uh, it's pretty amazing. I had a pretty in-depth conversation through Twitter. I hate Twitter conversations. Um, over the last couple of days with an atheist, somehow I get roped into these atheists online. I have these big discussions and, and all that. But, uh, yeah, he genuinely believes he's right. You know, he genuinely, and you know, he uses a lot of arguments, and of course I come back with my explanation, and it makes no sense to him, And all, which I told him, well, the Bible tells me it's not going to make sense to you. You know, it's a, it's a spirit. Yeah, it doesn't have that spiritual discernment that I talked about in verse 26 there, that he, the spirit will testify of these things. He doesn't have that within him, so he can't fully comprehend some of the, 
deep level of conversations he was wanting to have. I'm like, you just don't get it. You, you can't get it until you accept this as truth, receive the Holy Spirit, and he will explain this stuff to your heart and you'll understand it. And he's like, you know, he just blows it off. But a lot of people genuinely think they're right. There's a lot of believers. Well, I'll say a lot of Christians that say they're right. Because I don't believe that every person in every church is an actual believer. A lot of them claim to be Christians. But there's a distinguishing difference in a cultural Christian and an actual believer in Jesus, I think. There's a lot of people in church that aren't saved. They're just going to church because they think that's what they're supposed to do. I was that way for a lot of years, um, especially teens. You know, they're brought up, go to church, go to church, go to youth, go to youth. And as long as you do that, you're going to be okay. You know, a lot of churches will teach it's behavior-driven, that that's what gets you to heaven, and that's not. That's evidence of where you're going if your heart is right to begin with, and that's, you know, one of those cart before the horse kind of things. Um, but there's a lot of people that just truly get offended of the truth. He, who was most offended through this entire book? The religious people. They were offended at Jesus, who was God, who was the Savior of the world. And they were offended at him because he didn't fit into their mold that they thought he ought to fit into. Pretty big message for a lot of us to ponder. Because um, a lot of people think they're doing the right thing. They think they're doing God a service. But in reality, they're completely missing the mark because they're not truly doing the will of Jesus. And, you know, we have to be pretty in tune to the Holy Spirit and study of the Word of God to understand the difference. Y'all got any thoughts on that? I have a question. Yes. If this person is an atheist, would he even consider praying to God to give him an idea in his heart of what he should do? Well, I mean, he doesn't He doesn't believe. Right. And he sounds like he's not going to believe unless it's proven to him otherwise. Correct. Other than a conversation. Yeah, that's basically what he's waiting on is some type of just miraculous evidence. And what cracks me up about it, and it's sad at the same time, is he really knows the Bible. I mean, he's read it. I mean, he was pulling verses. He was talking about this person and pulling this verse in the Old Testament and pulling the stuff. In the, I mean, he knew his Bible. He's just like, it just doesn't seem logical. It's just, he's, he's overthinking it, in my opinion. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's like, I mean, his, his, evidently his grandmother was a believer. He's just an atheist. One of his big trip-ups was how in the world can you believe that a person who goes to heaven could deal with the fact that people that they love are in hell because they refuse to believe? How in the world is that a loving God? How is that even a logical thought? And my response to him was, you're just thinking too small. You know, when we get to heaven, it's going to be a whole different level of comprehension and comfort that comes to us. And it's just, that's what's going to be theirs beyond our comprehension of it here. I mean, we, we can't think that big yet because we're human and we're mortal and we don't have that perfect nature about us that God intended for us to begin with. But he just, he's using by, which is, it's ironic, I guess is the best use of the term there. It's ironic that he uses scripture to support his belief that God doesn't exist. <laughs> when the Bible came from God. <laughs> but in his view, all know just a bunch of guys wrote the Bible. In his view, there's no difference in the Bible and the Quran, and he said that in the conversations. I was like, well, due to the nature of the source of the Quran versus the Bible, you have a book given by 40 different writers over 1,500 years period of time versus the Quran where it's one guy over a few years. There's no way to corroborate the, the Bible and all the sources. If you just trust in one person's word, you better hope they're right. But if you've got 40 different writers over 1,500 years period of time, and they all corroborate with each other, and the New Testament backs up the Old Testament and vice versa, then that's evidence that this is valid. And, of course, we believe it's inspired by God, and the author is God, even though the writers were men used by God. 
But, Satan uh, used scripture too. Absolutely. And so I was going to bring yeah, that up, but I figured that might right trigger him a little too much. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, the, yeah, Satan did. He used scripture with Jesus. Yes. Yeah. The Word of God. I mean, that's pretty amazing. Um, so but, one yeah. thought you said about the uh, and you know, you said that the the religious believers thought they were right. And I've often thought, you know, they were afraid of losing their power, but it's more than that. Oh yeah, it's, there's a lot of variables. I think. I mean, what do you think beyond losing their power and all that? Well, I mean, what are your just, thoughts? Just on like that? you said, they, they are so in tune or in they so well studied in those first books right. that they they're not stepping back to allow something just out of a little bit out of their conception or how they right. view it should have been, they're not considering any other options. Exactly. And it, and that's where it's at. It's yeah. in your, your brain, it's in your mind, it's in your understanding. And that's why, you know, uh, it was Romans 12, the first two verses, it says, to be not conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You have to be willing to open yourself up to the truth that Jesus is bringing, and they just weren't open to that. He just didn't show up the way they thought. So they thought they were right the whole time, and Jesus is pointing out this is going to continue. These people are going to kick you out of the church, so to speak, out of the synagogue, and they're going to kill you thinking they're doing the right thing. Because all these things will they do unto you because they have not known the Father nor me, which is, again, they're thinking they're doing it in defense of God, but Jesus is stating very clearly they don't even know God. They know the scriptures, just like this atheist. He knows the Bible, but he doesn't know the God of the Bible. He refuses to open himself up to just embracing and accepting the truth of Jesus. And they're missing the mark completely. Verse 4 says, But these things have I told you that when the time shall come, you may remember that I told you of them. And these things I said not unto you at the beginning, because I was with you. So he he hasn't uh, <laughs> told them that they're all going to get killed one day <laughs> up to this point. He says, I haven't told you certain things because I was here with you teaching you what you need to know and be prepared with before I'm now revealing. And he says this a couple of times, that he's now going to speak to them differently. Of course, he's literally less than... 12 hours away from being crucified. So he's got just half a day left to tell them all this stuff, which is pretty amazing. Really, he's just got maybe a few hours because he's going to be taken in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's standing before Pilate by 6 a.m. You know, so this is probably, I don't know, somewhere in the neighborhood 9, 10 o'clock, maybe at the latest. So, you know, he's just got a few hours left to teach all these people, but he's taken into custody a big part of that time. So he's, his time is running thin here, trying to teach these fellows what they need to know. It says, but now, verse 5, I go my way to him that sent me. And none of you asketh me, whether, you, whether goest thou, because I have said these things unto you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient. This is a big verse uh, for all of us to even consider. It is expedient that I go away, for if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. He's talking about the Holy Spirit, of course. And that's a pretty big statement that we would not have the Holy Spirit within us if Jesus had not gone back to heaven. That's just kind of the way it was set up. He says, when he has come, verse 8, this kind of tells us the purpose of the Holy Spirit, what he does specifically. There's three things, um, well, at least three things, or four things really, that uh, Jesus says he's going to do. It says, and when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. So what do you think that word reprove means? Not a word we use most of the time in this day and times culture. Zachary, have you ever used the word reprove? <laughs> they, don't, they don't use that word in school these days. <laughs> I have never reproved my children at school. I have never used that verse. What do y'all think that means? Almost 
Mine's just convict. Okay. It, yeah, it is to to make clear. It is to um, reveal certain things. Convict is a good word. Uh, another word used for the a different translation. But it means that he's going to make it abundantly clear. He's going to teach. He's going to reveal. He's going to show you certain things. And those things that he's going to show is he's going to demonstrate to the world what sin is, what righteousness is, and what judgment is. And then he goes on to explain them in the next three verses. It says, of sin, because they believe not on me. So he's going to try, which I'm praying, this guy's name is Nicholas. I don't know much beyond that, this atheist I was talking about. Uh, but I'm praying that the Holy Spirit will convict and reprove Nicholas that what he thinks he's right about, he's completely wrong about. And that's the best thing I can do at this point. So, okay, that drops a question for me. So the Holy Spirit will work on him if he's not saved? Oh, absolutely. How do you think you were drawn to Christ? You saw the need of a Savior. How did you know you had a need of a Savior? The Holy Spirit convicted you and drew you to Jesus because that's what he does. It's not to say the Holy Spirit indwells in him. That's obviously not going to happen. But the Holy Spirit can certainly talk to people and convict people externally to draw them to try to soften their hearts so they open themselves up to receive the Holy Spirit into their life as they're becoming a born-again believer. Do you not think God can speak to lost people? How else would they get saved? I'm reckoning that. It's, it, That's what I was gearing toward right. with our first conversation. It's, I think, um, or I'm, I'm getting myself confused, is, you know, like, uh, there, there has to be the separation between God and sin. And, and he can't he can't have anything to do with sin at all. And well, God will not be able to hear his prayers. That's for sure. Right. The only prayer, and I've heard it explained this way. I, I dissect it a little differently sometimes, but the only prayer that God hears from a lost person is the sinner's prayer to receive God. I mean, God has to hear that prayer. Right. Right. right? So either. God never hears that prayer because he can't hear a prayer from a sinner? In that case, how would anybody ever get saved? Right? Mm -hmm. Or the point of it is that person, like we talked about the other week, they receive and accept the truth and become a believer as they're saying the prayer. And that's why God is able to hear them. It's kind of like, did they get saved at the altar or before they stepped out of the pew? Kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but obviously at some point, you know, what would drive a person? I remember the night before I went to, I think I probably got saved that night. I know I got saved the next morning, however you want to sp split that up. But I was literally uncontrollably shaking. I knew something was going on. And it was because I heard a message through a song. These guys were singing, I'm a child of the light. And they were talking about what it's like to be a child of God. And I'm like, I don't have that. I thought I did. I mean, I was 26 years old. I had been baptized as a middle schooler. I mean, I was raised in church, thought I was saved all those years. And it was like, you know, 12 years later, here I am, I'm trembling just feeling like if I don't do something about this, I'm literally going to die and go to hell. What did that to me? So your your thought was you were never saved as a middle schooler. Absolutely. I know that because of the motive. You know, I went down and got saved because my dad asked me, do you want to go get saved? If I ask Zachary, do you want to go get saved? Do you think he's going to want to, you know, say no to me? <laughs> yeah, I don't want to disappoint. I'm like, yeah, sure. It wasn't that I was drawn to God. I just was like, yeah, sure. And I went, 
the preacher said, go home, read this verse, say this prayer, and that's it. I was like, okay. So I went home, said the prayer. Everybody was happy. I didn't feel any different. And I questioned it all through high school. I was like, but then I blew it off and saying, oh, it's just the devil playing tricks on me. You know, he's wanting me to think I'm not saved. And I, and I struggled for years with it. And I finally just kind of settled into it and said, well, I guess it's just how everybody feels. But that night, when I was sitting in that service, something got a hold of me. And I think it was the conviction of the Holy Spirit telling me, you need to get this settled because you're not saved and you need to get saved. I mean, Joseph was the same way. You know, I was there when Zachary got saved and he wasn't completely emotional, but I could tell you were zoned in to what your teacher was telling you out there in the hallway. I mean, he was paying attention. He was sucked into it. It was like, this was the only thing that mattered to him in that moment. Now, Joseph, we were at the tent revival meeting with C.T. Townsend. And Joseph was crying. He was holding on to this chair in front of him. I mean, something got a hold of him. And he was just totally, I've got to go get saved. I mean, just that moment hit him. Um, and we went to the side, and he received Christ that way. But, it, I mean, what, what makes people do that? You got people who, like I'm talking to online, are like, Is, there's nothing to all that. You know, I can show you why not to believe it based on Scripture. You know, why would God, he uses the whole concept of genocide, which is a tough one to deal with. You know, God wiped out all the people on the planet. Mm -hmm. And he instructed, um, you know, the Israelites to kill men, women, girls, and children, the whole rest of it, as they're going in and taking over these cities. He's like, how can you say it's a loving God if he commands all these children to be killed and all this sort of stuff? And, and your God just threatens everybody with hell and all this sort of things. I mean, and he genuinely uses scripture to convince himself that it's not real, that this is just a man-made book and that's all there is to it. How is a person like that going to come to Christ? If the Holy Spirit doesn't do it, because I'm not going to be able to convince them. <laughs> Somebody's got to be able to convince them. And if you can come to Christ completely on your own, what's the point of the Holy Spirit? I think at some point people have to understand the concept of sin because a lot of people, especially this day and time, with the LGBTQ community and all that sort of stuff, they don't see anything wrong with anything. And they're teaching this to kids now, pushing this and all sorts of stuff in schools. You know, somebody has to stand up and say, this is sinful. But it's got to go beyond just our voice saying it, I believe. And I believe the Holy Spirit, that's part of the Holy Spirit's purpose, is to convict people. That's even a verse in the Bible that he will convict people of sin. I mean, that's, that's just in there. So he's going to convict people of sin. Let me make sure I'm keeping track of time here. Uh, because they have not believed on me. So the Holy Spirit's job is to lure them in and draw them in and bring them to Jesus. Of righteousness, which is to the believer, I believe, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. So if Jesus is going away, who's going to lead the believers? Well, the Holy Spirit's going to lead the believers. So the Holy Spirit is there to bring lost people to God, to teach further the believers in Jesus through God says, because you're not going to see me anymore because of this, the Holy Spirit will deal with how to stay in the right path going forward and of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. So it's the job of the Holy Spirit to convict of sin, to instruct in righteousness and to demonstrate what the judgment of God looks like because of the judgment that's placed upon the, the devil, basically. Those are the three of the reasons that Jesus explains there in those three verses. He says, I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. <laughs> He's like, you just, you're not going to be able to handle it. How be it, when he, the Spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit, is come, he will guide you into all truth. So that's another purpose of the Holy Spirit is to guide us in all things pertaining to truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, 
that shall he speak. Who's he going to hear it from? God, right? And even Jesus, he'll say here in a little bit if we get to it, <laughs> um, that he has simply spoken the words that God has told him to speak. So Jesus is speaking what God has told him to speak. The Holy Spirit will speak to us what God tells him to speak. So it's a hierarchy that always goes back to God the Father. Um, it says, But whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He will glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I that he shall take of mine and shall show it unto you. A little while and ye shall not see me. And again a little while and ye shall see me because I go to the Father. I'm going to skip or just condense the next little section here for sake of time but verses 17 down to 27 basically there's this back and forth the disciples are like what does he mean we'll see him a little while we won't see him for a little while and then we will see him. What, is, what is he talking about what does he mean and jesus even asked him are you questioning you know what i'm saying do you not understand what i'm saying and basically he's saying i've got to die i'm going to go away so you're not going to see me for a while but one day you'll see me again because if they're believers, they're going to go to heaven and we're going to see him again. Um, and he says in verse 20, he says, The world shall rejoice, basically, when he dies. And you will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will be turned into joy. This is a source of, you know, when I deal with people on the internet like I did the last couple of days, it's, it's painful and it's sorrowful and it's, like, frustrating. But one day... I can, you know, and I kind of left them with that verse in Luke that says, if you enter into a house and they receive you not, dust off your feet for a testimony against them and move on. I mean, it's all you can do. You planted the seed, pray for them, continue to try to ask God to send someone or even the Holy Spirit directly or something to reveal to these, these folks like that the truth. Um, but that's all you can really do. And I can say, well, I did my part. I planned a seed. I witnessed. Uh, I gave a testimony. And, and I can be joyful in that I did that because I love God and, and I believe in Jesus. Then he goes on to say, um, he uses the analogy of a pregnant woman. says, Or a woman giving birth. says, a woman when she is travail has sorrow. I've seen that four times now. <laughs> it's, it's quite a bit of sorrow says, when her hour has come, but because her hour has come. But as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembers no more the anguish. I've seen that as well four times. For the joy that a man is born into the world. Um, you know, if anybody's ever witnessed that or, or talked to people who've delivered, it's, it's not a fun road up until that point, and then that baby comes out, and then you forget about it all. It's like, the baby's here, and that's all you're focused on. That's kind of what it's going to be like for us, we, we travail with life and we struggle with sin and we deal with people like we deal with and all this stuff. But one day when we get to heaven, we're not going to remember all that, which is kind of part of the concept I was trying to talk to this guy about. We're going to be focused on Jesus and it's going to be worth it. And it's going to, all the, the pain and anguish will be over and the joy will be on a level we can't even think about at this point. I mean, I can't even comprehend the kind of level and joy of joy that we're going to have when we get to heaven to see Jesus face to face. The fact that he's interested in talking to you about it tells me that he's right he's reaching got his out. Own doubts. Yeah, and he continued. the The more I pushed, the more he was like, "See, you're just proving yourself wrong." And it's like he's trying to convince himself, kind of thing. I finally left it. Um, we went on a little bit longer. I was like, "Do you give people, you know, such?" Uh, a hard time over Santa, the Easter Bunny, and Halloween, or is this just God that you're that threatened with? <laughs> he never responded. At all. <laughs> so he's like, you know, he's because he seemed to be regarding. Oh, I'm concerned about truth. I'm like, okay, do you attack everybody that pushes all these other crazy ideas you know, with the same type of vigor? Of course, he's yet to come back. It's been a whole day since that. Um, but anyway, it says, And now therefore, ye, uh, uh, verse 22, And ye now therefore have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart shall rejoice, and your joy no man can taketh from you. 
going on down for sake of time, verse 27 says, The Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came out of God. I came forth from the Father and I am come into the world again. I leave the world and go to the Father. So he's He's really explaining what's going on. He, he did make a statement in 23 down to 25 or 6 where up to this point he's spoken to them in Proverbs, but I'm no longer going to do that. I'm just going to tell you plainly, and that's what he says there. I'm going to where I came from, and I came from God, and now I'm going back to where he is. I'm leaving this world, and I'm going back to God. His disciples said to him, Now you speak plainly. And speaketh no proverb, and they're admitting that okay, now we're we're getting it. We're understanding you're not using a story or an analogy. You're telling us exactly what's going to happen. It says now are we sure that thou knowest all things, and needest not that any man should ask thee? By this we believe that thou camest forth from God. Jesus answered them, Now do you now believe? And then he makes a big statement here. Of what's going to happen? He's like, Behold, the hour cometh, and yea, is come, that you will be scattered, every man to his own, and shall leave me alone. And yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. He's foretelling the fact that they're all going to depart and leave over these next few hours because Jesus is taken into custody. These things have I spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world, in the world ye shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Any thoughts through any of that? I like the question though about the you know the Holy Spirit speaking to lost people. I you know, my take on it is I believe that he can I mean, to say he can't is limiting God's power. So, you know, my my inclination is still he can speak. However, I, I believe that I, I I get myself. Sometimes it's a little in the in the circle, right? You, you start trying yeah. to well. I still question this, but I believe it just the same. You know, in the Old Testament, you know, Saul used the witch of Endor to bring Samuel back from the dead. Y'all remember that story? Mm, not right now. I don't yeah. Know. So Saul, he's king. Samuel's been telling him all along, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. God's going to kill you or take you out of the picture and put somebody in your place, which was David. Well, Samuel dies before Saul goes into this big final battle. And uh, he's wanting to know what's going to happen. He basically, Saul is, King Saul is like lost without Samuel's you know, direction, even though he never listened to him to begin with. And he goes to this, uh, I forget the exact term, but we would consider that a witch or a, I think they call it a soothsayer, you know, somebody with a crystal ball and all that sort of stuff. And went to this witch of Endor is the place that this person was from and has her bring Samuel back from the dead. And Samuel comes back from the dead and he asked Saul, he's like, why did you bring me back here? It's like, this is not a good thing. So the question is, did that witch actually have that kind of power? Or did God just allow it? I think God allowed it. Oh, absolutely. I was going to say, absolutely the latter, but right. there still makes you... Yeah, it's like, whoa. But and I think when you read the passage, it's I forget exactly where it's at, but the, the witch kind of seemed a little surprised at the same time that she actually did it because she didn't do it. It was the, it was God allowing this circumstance to take place because the message to Saul that Samuel gave him was, tonight you're going to die. By the end of the day, you're going to be dead. And that's what happened. The, the battle, you know, built up. All of his enemies surrounded him. He knew worse things were going to happen to him, so Saul fell on his own sword and killed himself. And that was the fulfillment of what Samuel told him was going to happen. But the whole idea, though, the reason I bring it up is that's a weird thing to think that God worked through a witch and brought someone back from the dead for a godly purpose to give a message to Saul. But it, that kind of opens my mind up of God can use anything. 
-hmm. and he can do anything through anybody, through any circumstance, even lost people. I don't fully comprehend that, but it's definitely in there, so it's kind of possible. To... Yeah. Anyway, um, all right, chapter 17. we got a few minutes here. Basically here, and I've just uh, highlighted a few words uh, that I think we can focus on and get through it in a little bit. But we're leading up to, again, chapter 18. If we look at chapter 18, the guards show up and take him in the Garden of Gethsemane. Gethsemane, it's hard, it's hard to say. So chapter 17 is a transitional chapter from basically their journey from the Last Supper uh, to the Garden of Gethsemane. And again, he's continuing the conversation. Uh, 17 starts out by saying, These words spake Jesus and lifted his eyes up to heaven and saying, Father, the hour has come. So in the context here, Jesus, we miss the whole part where Jesus says, Wait here. And pray for me. I'll go and pray. And he goes that if you, yeah. And they fell asleep. We don't get all of that from John, but we see this is truly what I would call the Lord's prayer. You know, we always use the other example of where Jesus taught them to pray. This is the actual Lord's prayer. He's praying in the Garden of Gethsemane to his Father. And he opens this prayer by saying, "Father, the hour has come. Glorify thy Son, and thy Son." that thy Son may also glorify thee. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life as to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. I like how he's not even pointing to himself in this moment. Even though he's the one about to die for the sins of the world, he's still pointing to God, the Father. He's being submissive in that regard uh, and not even taking credit to himself. He's giving credit to God. He's like that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus who you sent. He's kind of admitting, I'm just the person you sent to accomplish this. This is still going all back to you. It says, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou hast given me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. So that tells us how long Jesus has been around. He's eternal, just like God the Father, because again, Jesus is God, is the only way to tie all that together. So that is a big verse. And he says at the end of verse 24 that he was there before the world was. Pretty awesome stuff. It says, I have manifested thy name unto men which thou hast given me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou givest them to me, and they have kept thy word. Now they have known all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. Saying, they now know everything that I've done and everything I've given them, it has come from you. And that was the work. That was the point in which he came, was to make sure people understood that he came from God. He's not of himself and that they need to go through him to get to God to make sure they don't. Yeah, because a lot of, I think a lot of people still go there. They they go to church, they absorb religion, and they glorify, say, the work that Jesus did only. And they say, that's our model. That's our goal, to live like Jesus lived. That's missing the mark. Because that's your only goal, you haven't ever got to God. You've just gotten to the person that showed up on the planet, and you're modeling your life after their life. That's not why Jesus came. This states very clearly, they now know that I've done these things because of you, and because this is how to get back to you. And people really need to decipher that out and understand that it's, it doesn't stop at the cross. It doesn't even stop at the resurrection. It stops at the fact that he went back to God because that's where we're all trying to go is to be with God eternally. He says, I've given them the words which thou hast given me, and they received them and have known surely that I came from thee, and that they have believed that thou didst send me. I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine, and all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them makes a big statement in his prayer. It, it really impacts me. 
and I, I wish it would impact all believers equally. He says, Now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee. Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. To the point that you cannot really distinguish the difference in Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and God, believers should all also equally be that close together in our focus and in our mission. And that has not happened. Why do we have all these different denominations? <laughs> That's not a biblical thing. We have separated ourselves into different sects in that fact that we're not allowing this prayer to be really truly fulfilled. Now we can be unified within our own little local church, but are we unified with Methodist? Are we unified with Catholics? Are we unified with all believers in the world? I don't know that we are. I would say we're not. Exactly. But that was Jesus' prayer that we all be that tightly close together and unified in one, even as Jesus, the Son of God, and Jesus and God the Father are one. That challenges me. Because that tells me I need to stop being so self-centered and selfish in the way I think it works and just accept what the Bible teaches and let that be that and try to be unified in just the message that Jesus brought us. And that doesn't happen. <laughs> we see people, you know, churches and wars over music, over how this room is going to be used, over how, you know, oh, there's a scratch on the wall. Well, it's because we have kids in here and we're ministering to them, you know. Oh, the, oh, we got to, okay, well, we got to fix it. That's, it gives us a job to do around here in the church, you know. We got to be unified in what we're trying to do. And, and I see it all the time, you know, oh, you can't use that room because so-and-so used to teach a class in there. You know, it's like, come on. This is God's building. We're going to use it for whatever purpose we need to to reach people. And Jesus' message and his prayer was, that we all be unified. And he points out that one was not of them, the son of perdition, that was Judas, of course. Um, verse 13 says, And now I come to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. And then he prays for those he's been with, that they're going to be in the world, but, thou, but he prays that thou should be kept from the evil. Then he transitions into verse 20. Again, I'm summarizing for sake of time because it's almost 10 till. Uh, verse 20 says, this shifts to us today, sitting here in this room this morning in 2022. It says, neither I pray for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one. Again, he's pushing this that everyone needs to be unified in this message of the gospel, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I am thee. Again, uses that analogy, the, the same way we are the same, and we are perfectly unified, that they also may be one in us. Not one in their own church constitutions, not one in their own viewpoints and opinions, but that we're all one in God the Trinity. That's a really big, impactful thought for me through this passage. That the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And that's another reason. Why should we be unified? So that the world sitting outside sees that unity and wants to be a part of it. If they see us divided and fighting all the time, why in the world would they want to come join that? And that's what a lot of them say. Y'all can't even get along with each other. And most of y'all go out and do the same things I do on the weekend, so why in the world should I be a part of that? I'm already doing what y'all are doing. I just don't have to deal with all y'all's rules. <laughs> That's the way a lot of atheists, atheists look at it. Verse 23 says, I and them and thou and me, and they may be perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them, and uh, thou hast loved me. Father... I will that they also whom that thou hast given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me. For thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world hath not known thee, but I know thee, and these have known that thou hast sent me. Again, it keeps going back to that 
structure of hierarchy there. And I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. Again, unity, unity, unity is the message that Jesus was praying for, and the purpose he was praying for for our lives as he was in his last hours about to go to the cross. That's pretty impactful to me, anyway. Any thoughts on that? No, I mean, he kept driving this point home. So, I mean, so it must have been important. important. That's yeah. right. All right, I'm going to shut down online. We'll see you all next week.